It is the anniversary of Shinji's mother's death, and he visits her grave along with his father. We get a decently nice moment with the two as they share their thoughts on her. Asuka's kind of racist. I don't think he wants to meet his father. If he hates him so much, why doesn't he just say? You Japanese are weird. Masato gets drunk, and with perfect timing, Kaji steps in and actually starts being a goddamn character, albeit with the painfully overutilized element of insisting others not put themselves down or taking the whole fault when something goes wrong. Again, can we not have any time when for once a person actually insists against a person's persistence? Shu, I, I'm sorry. It's all my fault. It's all because I wanted her to fix up that stupid car. Yeah, it is. Uh, Hare died because of your stupidity. You wanted to play the hero, and Hare paid the price. I didn't know! It should have been you who died out there! <laughs> With the children at home and the kids getting hammered, knowing Shinji's mother died on this very day over a decade prior, this really serves as a turn-on before they have sex. I'm just kidding about that last part, but I hope I made you flinch. Anyway, they kiss. Antics. Masato follows Kaji as he enters Terminal Dogma, and he shows her Adam, as mentioned before, hanging inexplicably. Next up, the trio prepares to take down the next angel, and Shinji gets abducted by it. In this episode, it appears that Asuka would show implicit signs that she cares about him, which I suppose is kind of nice. Masato is bent on getting him back, and Shinji finds himself within the angel, and we get some more pretentious rhetoric. He eventually gets out because the unit goes haywire and Masato gets him out crying. Rei sits next to his bed as usual and Asuka being a sundere is embarrassed to be listening by. Again, establishing that his crewmates care for him is rather sweet. Investigation stuff. You know, I'm really not gonna lie, I'm not a fan of these long shots. And I don't care about the budget because they've done this multiple times before. Not only is the meaning behind them surreal at best, but they're entirely unrealistic sometimes. Anyway, Nerve is looking for the fourth child. Oh my god, chemistry with Hakari finally. She makes Toji, or right, the bully has a name, a meal as he shoots hoops happily. Moving on, holy shit, Shinji has to attack another human being. Well, it's unclear if he really did so. Shinji reflects on his actions and condemns his father once more. And ooh, more Hakari, let's focus on this. They have some sundere banter and Toji tells her to let his sister know that he's alright. Shinji decides to leave Nerve, and Asuka is their main hope. Suddenly, an attack starts up, and Shinji runs forth to find Kaji, who is outside gardening, as he was let off due to his position being exposed. He informs him that if an angel comes into contact with Adam, third impact will occur and wipe out humanity. Shinji returns to Nerve and gets into the Ava. Oh my god, what the fuck is happening? Okay, apparently the Ava is made from an angel, which I suppose I should have seen coming. And that angel is becoming self-aware, allowing itself to break free of the mecha armor. Shinji starts hallucinating, and we get some pretentious dialogue once more. We also see the female's full frontal, which I can't comment on because it pretty much speaks for itself. Besides, I've done way worse to them in Photoshop. Masato celebrates Shinji's safety by fucking Kaji. We see Kojo as a professor. Oh yeah, he has a name by the way. And he meets Shinji's mother I'd like to hug, Yui Akari. It turns out Jendo is naturally impulsive as Kojo meets him after a bar fight, and they get hitched before Yui dies from Second Impact. Jendo desires to know the truth about the debacle, and Kojo confronts him for knowing more than everyone else regarding it. Jendo shows him the prototype of Evangelion as mistaken as Adam, to which they decide to work together on for humankind. Ray joins the server and calls a worker named Mayoko an old hag, to which she makes the understandable response of strangling the bitch to death to which I assume another Ray comes around. Speaking of death, Kaji gets shot after freeing Kojo due to him being a thorn in Nerve's side. Great, now Asuka actually has a reason to be a bitch. Two, actually, as her mother died after not spending much time with her to begin with. I still assert that most would be nicer when put in her shoes, though. Anyway, we cut to the three at lunch. This is the first time all three of us have gotten together in a while. Why is there such an air of glue? Why in the name of God would things not be awkward? Why should I get it? It's probably just Kaji calling for you. You should answer your own phone. He won't call again. Hmm? Oh gee, someone's gonna have to tell her. I'll vouch. Asuka and Ray go into the elevator and... Oh god, this scene. Asuka starts piloting and her mind gets totally raped, prompting Ray to save her. Next episode... I'm really going to put this straight. This show has pretty much become a hollow shell of its former self. 
all of the characters are weakening in spirit, and it doesn't feel like there's anything to look forward to. I'm not sure if there's an audience for that kind of thing, but I'm really not digging it. Oscar stays over at the best character in the show's house and laments to her about her situation, to which she assures her competence. Now, obviously, a typical 14-year-old is not going to understand the complex feelings Asuka is undergoing that comes with being reduced from greatness to an ordinary person, but she's still sweet for trying. More pretentious philosophy. Oh my god, Ray died. Uh, again. Well, I guess she's back now, or that's the third version. Ritsuko strips for examination. And eh, you know what, I'll be mature about it. And she and Masato show Shinji around the place regarding more important elements. We end up in the room containing all the vessels for Rei, and it also turns out that each angel has the soul of a human, though only Rei can hold that kind of soul. She then destroys the bodies out of resentment for their existence, I suppose, but then starts crying as she realizes Jendo protected them more than he did her. Alright, so apparently Asuka's mother hung herself, and we realize how fucking dark everything has become as Shinji narrates how everyone in his life is effectively gone before we meet a new character named Kororu Humming Beethoven. He's naturally fit as the fifth child for an unknown reason, and also has romantic tendencies towards Shinji, which in this day and age I couldn't care less about. I just want to learn about his usefulness. Sweet damn Kororu was an angel this whole time, I assume from Adam. Betrayal. Philosophy. Another goddamn extra long shot and Shinji is forced to kill him. To be honest, Shinji's supposed mental state is closer to that of the state of Palestine, undefined and chaotic. And now, the elephant in the room, the last two episodes. These were done on a shoestring budget during unpredictable financial issues, and you can imagine my frustration when I saw this the first time. Just think if I was actually that engaged in what was going on. I would have started a riot. Oh wait, that's actually not terribly funny considering that the creator actually got death threats for how poorly it was handled. I'm not condoning the action, but the extremes of its backlash does indeed say something about your proficiency. I'm already bitter with how it is the third very dry series I can name that got mass popularity for reasons I will never understand along with Beavis and Butthead and King of the Hill, so I'm not going to hold back with my criticism on this duology climax. Let's go! I'm gonna be honest, part of me is afraid to jump to conclusions because maybe there's a whole justification for this shortcut. Like yeah, these episodes were the bare necessity, but it's okay because it's deep and simplistic and all that crap we've used to rationalize minimalism. I'll just go with the message I'm getting. Starting off, this is obviously a group therapy session between many of the characters. We don't learn anything new about them or even get anything more in terms of novelty set by the series' own standards other than maybe how Masato is ashamed for fucking Kaji and Shinji's bed, which, let's be honest, we're all guilty of during at least one point in our lives. As we reach the finale, it's not only no different, but I'd argue the production value is even cheaper. You may be hated by others. You fear acknowledging that weakness even to yourself. How can you criticize me when you do the same thing? You're right. At the core, we are all the same. Our minds lack something basic. And we fear that. Jesus Christ, I feel like I'm watching a college theater club performance. Ah great, now they completely jumped the shark. We get a look at an alternate reality in which Misato is the kid's teacher and they all go to the same class, I suppose, to demonstrate the possibilities of Outlook. Shinji then learns to not hate himself and we get a breakthrough. Oh, congratulations! Cold Phil Jr. has overcome his internal crisis, which, if we're being honest, isn't even that traumatic or special. It doesn't make clear if Asuka will get out of her mental conflict. Hell, what about the fate of the world? All the angels are gone, but Jendo and Nerve are still thriving. What on earth are they going to do? What does he work so hard and long for? And that's the series. I honestly don't know what to say. It certainly wasn't a masterpiece, I can tell you that. I was confused when I watched this the first time, and to be honest, I'm not terribly better versed now, but here's what I make of it. Evangelion is a series that puts an average reluctant teenager into the responsibility of saving the world at the risk of his life and causes mental peace on top of his current trauma. The people he finds himself with aren't much better than he is, and as the series goes along they all get dragged down by the stress brought by incredibly complicated circumstances regarding their setting and motivations. The show makes turns that fundamentally break the fabric the series was established on, and the main emphasis is on the human mental condition during times of crisis.
I suppose that might sound like a decently neat idea by the sound of it, but it would be a challenge to execute it correctly, and I just do not think this did. Whatever concentrated substance they had came across as boring as it was not manifested nearly as cleverly as the show thinks it is, and how, let's be honest, the characters aren't really that interesting. For the most part, they just seem like naturally average people who are only unique due to the circumstances they find themselves in, and it shows. They don't have innate motivations, they can honestly represent the average person who is contemptible. Hikari's pretty cool though, and yes, I am not joking, she is actually the best character in the show. She's in the same shoes as everybody else, but at least she's class representative which suggests a natural devotion, and while she seems to be uptight, you can tell she cares about people. Oddly, sometimes the right thing lies in the everyday scene. I don't know, I just like her personality the most as well. Alright, that's all for now. I'm going to continue this in the next episode where I review the movies.